Thank you, Don. Um, I am Ann Bays. I am from Whitley County, um, and I am a grass farmer. My husband, John, who happens to be a retired high school ag teacher, and I operate Moonlight Farm. We have 325 acres that we own, and we also have leased an additional 125 acres that borders our farm. So we've basically got about 450 acres to work with. On this farm, we raise beef cattle. We've got about 160 head now. We raise pigs. Um, we raise quarter horses that are bred for barrel racing. And we raise chickens. When we took over this farm in 2011, it was basically a jungle. Um, you couldn't tell one field from the next because it had basically been set, let to sit idle for about 15 years. Now that is a, both a blessing and a curse. Um, we knew we could set it up like we wanted to, but we basically didn't have you know, a plan to go by. So the only thing we needed to do was to start bush hogging, which we did. And as soon as we could get a grip on where the fields were, um, we started taking soil tests because we needed to know where we were to start with. So we soil tested every single field that we could get to. And um, unfortunately, these results came back and told us that we needed to apply $60,000 worth of soil amendments. And there was no way we could do that. So we opted to lime. We limed everything that we could lime. We limed good and heavy to at least start getting our, uh, our pH right. Um, we are very fortunate in Whitley County because the, through the efforts of the county government, we do not have to pay for soil tests. We can have as many soil tests done every year at absolutely no charge. And that is an incredible blessing to us. Um, Going back a little bit of history on myself, I, have, I was raised in the city, had no farming experience other than when I was in my 30s, I bought a horse and then I had to have land to put the horse on. So um, I bought a little eight acre farm outside of Nashville and decided I wanted to have a cow. So these are my first two cows. Um, they are Scottish Highlands, they were registered. This is a picture that I still carry in my wallet today of those first two cows. So. I got to learn cow through this wonderful breed. Um, they are very hardy, they are very docile, and they are incredibly efficient foragers, um, which was really good because my goal was to someday sell grass-fed beef. Um, whoops, okay. When uh, we Moved to this farm in uh, 2011. We moved my herd of cattle over there. And, you know, I, I guess I shouldn't have been surprised, but these cattle, even though all we had done was bush hog the weeds off of this farm, these cattle started to thrive. And it proved to myself that they really are the efficient foragers that I had studied them to be. Um, I was adamant that these cattle were going to eat nothing but grass. And uh, to this day, that's what we do. We totally raise them on grass and hay from birth all the way to processing. Um, and they are very well suited for it. Um, John, early on, he uh, sent me to a uh, grazing school or a grazing conference, I wish, if you will. It was down at the University of Tennessee. And we spent a whole day with Jim Garrish showing us spreadsheets and explaining to us how making hay is the wrong thing to do. Kenny Bernan would have been so happy at this seminar, it would have been, you know, amazing because we just, you know, he convinced me that it does not make any sense to make hay. And so, of course, here I have these animals that all I want to do is feed grass. And so I came back from this, from this seminar just absolutely pumped up and couldn't wait to tell my husband that we were going to quit making hay and only do grass. And uh, he told me that he had just purchased a brand new big round bale baler. <laughs> so we had a little bit of negotiating to do. Um, 
John and I started attending every grazing conference, every seminar, everything we could do to learn about foragers. forages. Now, keep in mind, I had no farming experience. He did have, but I would say more of his was in old school ag. But I was very fortunate that both he, both he and myself, we are very receptive of new ideas. And we wanted to learn the new ideas. And we wanted to try to apply the new ideas. So, which is what we did. Well, going back to this $60,000 worth of amendments we needed that we couldn't afford, we figured clover was a death, was a next best option. So we started seeding clover into all of our fields. Um, we basically were using a mix at that time of red clover, orchard grass, bluegrass, and maybe a little bit of white clover. And, uh, buddy, we, we seeded it absolutely everywhere, and we had a... We had a really good stand. We uh, are 100% no-till on our farm, and uh, we were very successful in, uh, in growing this clover. Well, through the years, we have seen our soil tests improve. Our pH has improved. We started out with, you know, 5.5 down to 5. We are now up into the 6s, 6 and a half. So that's, you know, through the liming, um, our nutrient content has definitely improved. We're seeing our forage stands improve. Um, and it, it's been a really, really great thing. Um, in 2011, John convinced me to leave my previous career as an engineer and farm full time. And I thought, oh boy, here I go. I can now sell grass-fed beef. So I picked out my biggest steer at that point, I took it to the processor, had the whole thing ground up into ground beef, went to the local farmer's market with a cooler of ground beef, that's all I had, and sold it all summer long at $5 a pound, and everybody loved it. And I was finally felt like that I was realizing my dream. And this was really fun for me. Now, since the farm had been, you know, we still had lots to do, and we had learned a lot at all these grazing seminars, and we decided we wanted to try rotational grazing. So John suggested we should go visit NRCS and see if they could help us. So we did, and um, he drug me in there, kicking and screaming, because the director at that time forced me to sit down and do an entire conservation plan of the farm. Now, keep in mind, I couldn't find my way from the back side of this farm to my house much less know where I wanted water tanks, where I wanted fences, where I wanted, you know, it was, it was just a huge task, and I just didn't understand why that was so important. Well, today, I do understand that, and I'm so thankful for that exercise. This basically was the plan that we came up with. Um, basic, basically, that was about in 2011, and I'm real happy to say that this year or within the next two years, we should be finishing up this plan. We've still got a little bit of ways to go, lots of fencing, but we have made great strides on getting this done. Um, through NRCS's help, we were able to fence the cattle out of ponds we, and streams. We were able to create paddocks um, for them to, to, so we could do rotational grazing. We installed heavy use areas. Um, we um, and our, our cattle are um, watered with city water now, too, through that. Well, John had another idea, and uh, this was to add some commercial cows to our herd. So we went out and bought some crossbred heifers. Um, the whole idea here was that I would continue to do my grass-fed beef with my highlands, and then our crossbred herd, we could raise those, we could sell calves at weaning, and I kind of lovingly called them our cash flow cows. Um, and so we did that, but what that meant is that we really had to ramp up our forage game because those commercial cows are not near as efficient foragers as my highlands are. And so they do need to be supplemented a little bit more, they needed to be pampered a little bit more, and we really had to ramp up that forage game. One of the programs we went to was the Master Grazer program. And um, through this, I learned about strip grazing. Well, we took a summer, and we actually took our entire herd. At that point, it was about 60 head of cattle. 
um, more highlands than commercials. And uh, I'm going to try to point here. Maybe I can, yeah, there it is. That little field right there, which is 20 acres, um, we managed to grow enough grass and good enough forage in there so that we could strip graze this, ac this acreage, it's 12 acres, excuse me, not 20, all summer long on every cow that we had. And once again, that just proved to myself that all this that we were learning is really good stuff. And it was something that I wanted to learn more of and do more of. Um, as you can see, we had a really good stand of forage. We strip grazed. We did not back, we did, excuse me, we did back fence this in the beginning. Um, so I think this is the coolest picture right here. Um, this is the, the uh, strip that they're going into right here. Um, this is the strip that they are just coming out of. And you can see back here, this is the strip that they were in immediately prior. And we worked through this, this little field, all summer long. And when we got to the end, we would come back and we'd start over. Um, the two characteristics of the two different types of cattle that we used to our favor was that the commercial cows, they wanted to graze in the daytime. And so we let them into that field in the daytime to graze. And then we would put them in the side fields and the woods at night. The highlands were totally opposite because of their long coat, they wanted to be in the, in the fields in the, day, in the nighttime, and we put them in the woods in the daytime. So basically, we just had to work with what we had. In 2014, we did another one of these major life-changing things, and that is we had Bill Payne to come out, who is a technical service pro pro provider with NRCS, and he did a complete grazing management plan. Um, I cannot say enough good things about this experience. I recommend that everybody do this because it just opened our eyes to more opportunities for that. He um, established a planning plan for us. He established a grazing plan for us. And although we have not adhered to it exactly, it is something that you can, as you can tell from the, the book, you know, we refer to it a lot. Um, we take it out into the field with it and it, and it's one of those pieces of the puzzle that we go back to a whole lot as we're planning every year what we're going to do. One thing, you know, as, as we, we have already heard today, we had to deal with the summer slump in our forages. So once again, we had heard about um, sorghum Sudan grass, and this was really fun. Um, so we planted a field of sorghum Sudan grass. You can see it was very tall, and you, that's a cow right there. You can hardly see him. We turned them in there, they ate it up, it was great, it was easy, and I highly recommend it to everybody. Now, we still make hay. We still have that round baler, and we still make hay, and we still make a lot of it. But through all of our seminars and such, we have learned a whole lot about making hay. Um, first and foremost, we learned to not cut our hay too short. You know, I'm so used to watching producers in our area. You go out after they've cut hay and they've scalped it. Well, we've set our mower up to where we try to leave at least a four inch residual. It helps with our second cutting. It helps when we want to graze after it. It helps our forage stand. You know, it's just, it's just what you need to do. The other things that we learned, when we started out, we were putting our round bells and all we could do is just move them to the edge of the field for storage. We did that until we decided, okay, we're going to start piling them up in these pyramid things and covering them big with, big with big hay tarps. That worked well. We saved a lot of hay by doing that. And we have finally moved to the last option, and that is we've got hoop barns. Um, we have our first hoop barn that we're storing hay in. And we have now, we've just now finished our second hoop barn that still needs its sides and everything. And we have strategically placed these on two different parts of the farm so that it is where we're going to feed the cattle. So we can minimize the usage, you know, the ruts and stuff from winter feeding. Um, equally as important as soil testing is forage testing. We try to do that every year in our fields just so we can keep up with how our grasses are doing. John and I are, are very um, passionate about sharing our farm with, um, with the community. Um, this is a a field day that we had for the Whitley County Cattlemen's Association to learn about rotational grazing. And um, we had a field day where we basically talked to 
um, the extent, extension office program about how to use a seed drill and that kind of thing. And those were well attended. Now, we've done two new things. Um, this is not for the faint of heart, I guess, if you will. Um, last spring, we decided to try native grasses. Um, we, um, we planted the native grasses. It's not a cheap uh, thing to do. We did that. And when it started coming up, I got so excited. Here it comes. You know, we're getting a good stand. And when I really looked at it and talked to John about it, it's like it's all crabgrass. And uh, we didn't know what to do. We consulted two different people, you know, and we got two different schools of thought. Um, one said, don't do anything. Just leave it alone because this stuff takes three years to establish. Got to be patient. And I'm not a patient person, but just don't do anything. The other one, who was an actual producer, um, said, bush hog it. Get those weeds off of it. And that's the tack that we decided to take. So we did, excuse me, we didn't bush hog it, we mowed it. Um, we did one hay mowing on it. We mowed that very high, six to seven inches, got that residual off of it. And now I'm just holding my breath and we're hoping this picture was actually taken this morning of that field. So that's what we've got. Hopefully next year we will start seeing more native grasses, and hopefully, you know, I'll be able to report that it was a successful project. Um, the bigger thing that we have done is last year I purchased a meat processing plant. Um, so now I'm very fortunate to be able to raise my cattle from birth and then literally take them all the way to the plate because I have control of processing my cattle as well. And it's given me a real unique opportunity to study my carcasses, my grass-fed beef. Um, we are now taking some of our cross-bred cross cattle, and we are actually grain finishing them. So I can see the difference. These all have a Highland Daddy, but um, they are all cross-bred mamas. Um, five points I want to leave you with. Soil and forage testing are a must. You have to know where you are so you can know where you need to go. Secondly, constant learning. Kentucky does a great job of providing these sort of educational opportunities for people to go and to learn. And, you know, extension is just phenomenal at being there when you call with the answers. Third, make a plan. That's what we did with conservation when I was kicking and screaming about it. That's what we did with Bill Payne with our grazing management plan. And we have stuck to these plans as best we could from the start of the farm up till now. Don't ever be afraid to step outside that box. Um, it's hard sometimes, but it can also um, reward you with a lot of gains that you might not expect. And then the biggest thing is to never give up on your dreams, because I did have that dream back in, in 2000 of selling grass-fed beef, and it's taken me a long time to do it, but I now do it, um, and it's really a great thing, so just never, ever give up on those dreams, no matter how big they might be. And with that, I will end. And if anybody has questions, I will try to answer them. Yes, and it was very hard. It is a dismower. They aren't. And uh, we had to set it on its highest setting, and then we actually had to make a few little adjustments to get it up a little bit higher because they do not want, I mean, they're not built to do that. Uh, native grasses? Yeah, we did uh, big blue stem, little blue stem, and Indian grass. We did the combination of all three of them. And I hope they're there. All right, let's give a round of applause.